It's the dawn of a new century, and King Henry IV sits on the English throne. But the way he seized power was controversial, and his claim to the throne is weak. But what if King Henry has the qualities of a good ruler? As Act I unfolds, you be the judge. The play opens with the weary king expressing his desire for civil war to end in England. There has been a lot of bloodshed in the wake of his rise to power, and he's sick of it. What England needs is a foreign campaign to unite it. King Henry sets his sights on Palestine and calls for a crusade to capture the Holy Land in the name of Christianity. Will this win him English hearts and take the focus off his dubious claim to the throne? Or perhaps he's doing it to ease his conscience for snatching the throne from King Richard II. But King Henry's plans are thwarted by the Earl of Westmoreland. There's bad news. There'll be no foreign crusade while civil war rages on in England. In Wales, the English have just suffered heavy losses against the forces of Owen Glendower, the Welsh warlord magician. Glendower is an enemy to King Henry IV and rejects his reign. He's also taken the king's cousin, Mortimer, prisoner. A thousand English soldiers were killed and their corpses disfigured by witchy Welsh women. How shocking. And that's not all. At Homden, on the Scottish border, English forces have clashed with the Scots in a bloody battle. The English were led by the gallant Hotspur, young Harry Percy the most dashing man of the age. The outcome was uncertain at the time of the message, but Sir Walter Blunt has an update. Hotspur has won the day at Homden. And he's taken a bunch of Scottish noblemen as prisoners. That Hotspur really is an extraordinary young man. At this point, the king becomes sad. His own son, Hal, is nothing like Hotspur. In fact, his party boy behaviour is a major embarrassment to King Henry. If only it could be proven that a fairy switched Hal and Hotspur in their cribs and Hotspur is King Henry's real son. That's how ashamed the king is of Hal. Then again, Hotspur is a proud and defiant young man. He told the king's messenger that he'll be keeping all his Scottish prisoners except one. As a side note, it was customary for the winning side to keep their noble prisoners as spoils of war and ransom them off for big bucks. The only prisoners that must go to the king are the ones with royal blood. So technically, Hotspur's not doing anything wrong. But King Henry, who's keen to assert his new power, is annoyed that Hotspur has refused his royal request to send all his prisoners. The Earl of Westmoreland thinks the troublesome Earl of Worcester has encouraged Hotspur to behave this way. The Earl of Worcester is Hotspur's uncle, and his allegiance to King Henry is shaky at best. The king is going to summon Hotspur to Windsor Castle to explain himself. Hopefully, that will clear things up. Meanwhile, Prince Hal is totally unconcerned with his father's dramas. He's elsewhere in the palace, hanging out with his good friend, Sir John Falstaff. He's probably not the best influence on Hal, but he adores him like a son. When Falstaff asks Hal for the time, Hal thinks it's a ridiculous question. All Falstaff is good for is mischief, drinking and fornicating. The time of day is irrelevant to him. Falstaff thinks that's a good point. Being a thief, he's really more of a nightbird. This is how Falstaff and Hal carry on. They banter to and fro, seizing each other's words and twisting them to their advantage. Although Hal generally has the upper hand, what with being the prince, and the fact that he bankrolls Falstaff's debauchery. But beneath the humour are a few reality checks. Prince Hal makes quips about justice and the hangman, things Falstaff should watch out for if he continues his wild ways. 
while Falstaff reminds Hal that he has royal duties. He says that an old lord of the council stopped him in the street the other day to talk about Hal. Clearly, questions are being asked about Hal's conduct and the company he keeps. Falstaff then blames Hal for leading him astray and promises to give up his life of sin. Yeah, right. Hal then asks where they'll commit robbery tomorrow, and Falstaff is keen for action. When Hal's friend Ned Poins enters the room, a plan begins to form. Early tomorrow morning at Gad's Hill, men will pass through carrying bags full of money. They're ripe for the taking. Poins has masks for them to wear. All they need is their horses. A career criminal, coincidentally named Gad's Hill, will help them out with the robbery. Afterwards, they'll all meet up for a meal in Eastcheap. Poins has already arranged it. What fun! Now that there's an actual plan in place, Hal seems reluctant to join in. But Poins knows how to twist his arm. When Falstaff leaves, Poins gives Hal the real plan. While Falstaff and his cronies commit the robbery at Gad's Hill, Poins and Hal will hang back. Then Poins and Hal will jump out in disguise and rob Falstaff and the others of all their stolen money. Poins predicts that Falstaff will run away before he can recognise either Poins or Hal. But the best part will be when Falstaff and his men get back to Eastcheap empty-handed. Poins can already foresee the astonishing lies Falstaff will tell of how they were ambushed by 30 men. Hal agrees. Oh, this is going to be good. Once Poins leaves and Hal is alone, Hal shows us a different side of him. He reveals that he'll continue this wild life for a little while, even to the point where people think he's a lost cause. But eventually, he'll turn his back on it all. He's going to redeem himself and amaze everyone with his transformation. What do you think? Will party boy Hal turn his life around? A short time later, Hotspur faces the music at Windsor Castle. His father, Lord Northumberland, and Uncle Worcester are there to back him up. These are the patriarchs of the Percy family, and they've been powerful allies to King Henry. Hopefully, they have a good excuse for refusing to send the Scottish prisoners after the Battle of Homden. The king is annoyed and admits to the Percys that he's been too soft recently. Well, no more Mr Nice Guy. King Henry needs them to know who's boss. Lord Worcester doesn't appreciate this and reminds the king that he's in that position because the Percys put him there. For this, the king kicks Worcester out of the meeting. Uh-oh, this isn't going well. Lord Northumberland cuts in on his son's behalf. Hotspur never meant to offend the king. This is all a misunderstanding. Now Hotspur pipes up. He tells the king the story of how this apparent defiance took place. he just finished up on the battlefield, all bloody and exhausted, when the king's messenger rocks up. The way he looked so fresh and smelled so sweet really annoyed Hotspur. But when he demanded Hotspur's hard-won prisoners, Hotspur did his lolly. In fact, he doesn't even know what he said to that pretentious messenger. But he never meant to offend the king. So Walter Blunt thinks that's fair and tells the king to give Hotspur a break. But hang on, Hotspur may not have meant offence, but he's still refusing to send the Scottish prisoners. In fact, he'll only do so when the king pays Mortimer's ransom to Glendower. By the way, Hotspur is married to Mortimer's sister, making them brothers-in-law. This partly explains Hotspur's hard bargain for Mortimer's ransom. The king is not impressed with this. He believes Mortimer is a traitor and that he willfully defected to Glendower's side. Proof of that is that Mortimer has recently married Glendower's daughter. No, Mortimer can starve for all King Henry cares. He won't spend a penny on him, and if Hotspur demands Mortimer's ransom, he's no friend of the king. 
Now it's Hotspur's turn to get annoyed. Mortimer is no traitor. He fought hard against Glendower, and it was just bad luck that he ended up in the Welshman's clutches. But King Henry doesn't want to hear Mortimer's name anymore. As far as he's concerned, Mortimer is a traitor, no ransom will be paid, and give up those Scottish prisoners. And with that, the meeting ends. The king and his entourage leave, and it's just as well because Hotspur is wound up. In his anger, he starts running his mouth, and his father and uncle have a hard time calming him down. Uncle Worcester is sure that King Henry hates Mortimer because he has a stronger claim to the English throne. In fact, before King Henry snatched King Richard's crown and sent him to his death, Richard II proclaimed Mortimer as his heir. No wonder King Henry wants Mortimer to starve. The Percy family did King Henry's dirty work and helped him to his high position, and their family name has suffered as a result. Since the king seems to resent the debt he owes to the Percys, Hotspur wants revenge. It's time to restore the Percys' family honour. After Hotspur finishes his angry rant, Uncle Worcester shares his secret plan. It seems he's been plotting a rebellion against King Henry for a while which makes King Henry a perceptive man. Remember how he sent Worcester out? So, here's the plan. Hotspur will return the Scottish prisoners to their rightful lands, without collecting ransom, and make alliances with the Scots. While Hotspur makes new friends, Lord Northumberland will approach the Archbishop of York. He's a powerful man who's raging over the execution of his brother, Lord Scroop, and is keen to rebel against King Henry. Hotspur is excited for the rebellion. The Scots, Percys, York, Mortimer and the Welsh forces, all in league against King Henry. What could go wrong? Worcester cracks the whip. They've got to seal their alliances before King Henry smells a rat. When Worcester sends word, they'll all meet again at Glendower's castle in Wales. Well, well, it looks like King Henry can kiss goodbye to a peaceful reign. Will Hal step up to help his father in this crisis? Or will he be too busy playing jokes and partying in Eastcheap? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.